So welcome all of our viewers. We're ready to go ahead and get started. We're excited for a very uh, great night this evening. Uh, the title of our Network and Learn tonight is called Technology and UDL Behind Beyond the Controversy. So we're delighted to have all of you here with us this evening. Uh, we have a, a very special panel joining us tonight. Um, and uh, before, before we get started with that, I want to mention to all of you that um, we will be relying on you to give us your feedback, ask questions of our panels. So to do that, um, we ask that you use our hashtag UDLIRN, hashtag UDLIRN, and that will um, uh, lead you directly to uh, Brian Dean, who will be hosting our uh, Twitter chat in the background this evening. So I'm going to just take a moment here and share my slides so, so that you can see that. And here we go. So put this in presenter mode and everybody can see then. Um, so there is our hashtag for this evening, hashtag UDLIRN. Uh, I'm your moderator. My name is Susan Harden, and I am the uh, coordinator of our professional learning co com committee at the UDLIRN. I'm also uh, the AT coordinator and UDL coordinator in uh, Michigan at Macomb Intermediate School District, and we're delighted to have you this evening. These are our panelists, as I mentioned earlier. We have four very strong voices from the UDL field, and we're delighted to have them with us this evening. We have Dr. Kathy Howery, the consultant from Kate Consulting, and Dr. Matt Marino, associate professor from the University of Central Florida. Matt is also a member of our UDL IRM leadership team. And joining us from Milton Hershey School is Matt Bergman. Matt is a learning technology specialist. And our fourth panelist for this evening is Dr. Jamie Basham. Jamie is an associate professor at the University of Kansas and is also um, the UDL IRN CEO. So we're delighted to have them all with us this evening. Uh, and then joining us from the backstage will be uh, Brian Dean. Brian will be our Twitter and chat moderator. And Brian is also um, on the Universal, or excuse me, the UDL IRN Professional Development Committee, and he's an education consultant from Oakland Schools. So each of our panelists will tell, the, tell you a little bit more about themselves uh, when they begin speaking. So tonight's plan, um, we are going to start with just a brief introduction to what is Universal Design for Learning and what is the role of technology in UDL. And then each of our panelists will have a few moments to uh, share their position on uh, the role of technology in UDL. And then uh, we'll have a chance to have a conversation amongst us because that's the best part of the evening, right? Where everybody has a chance to kind of shoot back and forth about their opinions uh, on tonight's topic. And then we'll ask you to join in by sharing questions or comments or answers, either via the chat if you're viewing the live webinar, or via Twitter if you happen to be watching us via live stream. So I'm gonna just, uh, as a way to anchor our, our conversation tonight, I'm gonna share with you four different perspectives. It's a way for us to um, kind of think about uh, UDL and technology and have our panelists respond to that, push back on that, and our, our Twitter um, participants as well. So the first um, position I'd just like to talk about, and this is one that you uh, read about often in the literature and, this, and different uh, UDL experts share this uh, passion that really without technology, UDL is just a good idea. And what do they mean by that? Well, this ar argument, um, means that even when an educator has a strong foundational knowledge uh, of the underpinnings and the desire to do and design with the UDL framework in mind, without technology, it's almost impossible to actually operationalize UDL in, in the classroom, uh, in the world. And so the, the uh, argument is that uh, technology is really central to UDL because it's what provides the flexibility. It's what provides the accessibility. Um, it makes it possible for kids to have access to the content in multiple ways. 
Uh, it also allows for um, personalization. So without technology, it's very difficult to build in that adjustability and that just for me kind of feel to um, curriculum. And it also allows for assistive technology. But equally, you'll find people who will argue that uh, UDL is a framework for developing expert learners and technology need not apply. So the idea is that if the ultimate goal, as when you look at CAS guidelines 2.0, is that we develop these expert learners, that teachers can create lessons and environments um, that are consistent with the UDL framework without having to include technology as part of that um, instructional design. Because if you look at that last line of what is uh, an ex expert learner, it mentions things like resourceful and knowledgeable, strategic, goal-directed, purposeful, uh, motivated, and really that can all be accomplished without technology. So those are two pretty strong uh, divergent arguments. Uh, then there's one argument that kind of sits right in the middle, right on the fence, if you will. And that is that teachers can create UDL lessons and environments without technology, but the flexible knowledge, uh, nature of technology makes it much more practical to implement. So essentially it's not required, but certainly with technology, it makes the lesson a whole lot better or the environment or whatever it is that's being designed. And then the last argument that's sort of made its way into the conversation, and this is a relatively new one, is that this whole argument is silly. We're in the 21st century and technology, technology is ubiquitous. So with one-to-one -one classrooms uh, and the degree with which technology has permeated all the aspects of our economy and our classrooms, our instruction, um, it's essential that we include technology because it's part of the learning. It's just another piece of literacy and using it in, uh, within the UDL framework certainly makes sense. So those are four kind of competing conversations that are available um, when you read about UDL and technology. And now I'd like to let our panelists reflect on their own personal story as related to technology. And I believe Kathy is up first. So Kathy, go ahead. Kathy, you need to unmute your microphone. Your microphone is muted. Yeah, there. sorry. Yeah, I was thinking it was a toggle. It's not a toggle. I actually have to choose from a list. So sorry about that. Okay. Um, so um, what I was saying is I really liked your four points. Um, I agree with three out of the four of them, and it will be interesting to see if by the end of my introduction, uh, whether you can know which ones or whether I maybe need to talk a little bit more. So I've been doing this work for a long time. When I talk about assistive technology and special ed, um, I my, my question is how many of you were born when I started doing this? And usually uh, in my, more recent years, there's been more people in my environments that I'm talking to that haven't been born than have been. So anyway, so I started in the world of assistive technology, 1982, the adaptive firmware card, the echo speech synthesizer, um, really seeing for the first time how some really challenged kids could do things um, and participate and show what they knew in ways that were just not possible without that old clunky Apple II computer. Um, to the iPad, you know, which was a big revolution in our world and yet still where I still had to think about how do I truly make uh, that accessible to all, if we really do mean all and every. And then more recently to my doctoral work in experiential um, uh, work, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that on the next slide, maybe Sue, please. So my background is I started way back in the day in a very uh, specialized school where really we were trying to adapt everything um, with that old you know what now is clearly old-fashioned technology um, I went through a variety of different um, 
experiences, most of them being very inclusive. Uh, I'm from Canada. Um, most of our kids are actually included in their community school and in their classrooms. It's while there are still segregated classrooms, um, they're becoming more and more rare. So a big part of my work right now is how to really say everybody finds a place in curriculum. Um, so I, I've been doing a lot of that. I went and did doctoral studies. And on the other side, you can see that I, you know, I did some adaptive technologies, which became a System as they became more and more built in, which made my life and everyone's life easier. I did a lot of work in the area of universal design for learning. And in fact, when I went to do my doctoral studies, that was what I was thinking to study, but I just couldn't get my head around it um, to, I guess the word would be operationalize it, to think about studying it. So I, for, and I'm not going to go into this tonight, but for a variety of reasons, went back to, I guess, the kids of my heart and worked on uh, AAC for my doctoral research. Um, I'm hoping to write a paper on what the, where the, what, what the world looks like if we think about kids that are augmentative and alternative communication users and the world of UDL, but that will be soon. So next slide, please, um, Sue. I came to this uh, world of UDL, again, a very long time ago. Um, the paper by Orcus and McLean in 1998 absolutely, I guess, um, enthralled me. I have the right word there, word there. So where they talked about in 1998, a curriculum that has been designed considering the diverse classroom. So I'm thinking considering all the kids that might come to a classroom, um, so where the curriculum has built-in means for teaching and each student can have meaningful access, I'm going to talk a little bit about access, um, to it using his or her strengths and abilities without having to overcome the usual physical, affective, or cognitive barriers and without being stigmatized or isolated from other students. This paper is really quite amazing. If you haven't read it, I would highly recommend you go back and find it because they really outline um, what this promise could be as well as, and next slide maybe please, um, they also talk about what, what teachers need to do if they were given that curriculum at hand. Um, for me, um, and this will be where I land more on the side of technology being critical than not um, accessible digital media. So not just digital media, not just 21st century media, that's not sufficient, um, but uh, uh, accessible media was really the key. I started out where CAST did, I had the CAST e-reader and uh, the gateway stories were phenomenal because I could make those stories work for just any kid, uh, switch access or um, uh, needed um, talking buttons, whatever that, you know, not whatever, but that was the beginning of whatever they needed. And so that enthralled me. And I, I took this image off of the latest book by um, uh, David and, and Anne, uh, David Rose and Anne Meyer, where the little guy there with the switch on his chin, those were many of the kids that I was seeing, although the kids that I was seeing weren't quite, uh, they also needed cognitive scaffolds, not just um, sensory and physical scaffolds. So next slide, please. Um, then following that was the paper that really grabbed me by the teeth, I guess, and everything else, is this idea that these new technologies, uh, digital technologies, text-to-speech, the ability to transform and shift um, the digital media pretty seamlessly were going to um, really change um, things for the students at the margins. And I know this is another topic that's been, maybe you could have another uh, UDL IRN to talk about who are these at the margins kids. But really the idea um, if, and I think next slide maybe, I don't know if it's, now I've kind of lost my place in my slides. Maybe Sue, can you go up a couple? One more, no, forward, this one. But yeah, this, the, the Jean Greco slide, and then I'm gonna go back, sorry. So can you go to the, the really common Gian Greco slide where the, the, the fellow was uh, shoveling the snow. 
Thank you. Um, so really, you know, for for my kids, in order to get in, even if the ramp is there, they still need technologies. They still need the wheelchairs. They still need the AAC devices. And then you can go back. Sue, I'm sorry, I'm really bad at letting other people drive. Um, we, in order to do that, we really do need accessible, and I've got a, a little asterisk there, because as I've already alluded to, it, a real accessible digital curriculum that in my imagination is given to teachers, not, um, and I've been waiting for that since 1998, um, and working on it a little bit here in Alberta, and maybe I can talk about that a little bit, um, is that there's, there's, cog there's access for kids with, who intellectually can't manage the curriculum at that level, even if it's read to them, that there's sensory access. So access is the minimum, but we need to think of access in a broader way. So access to digital curriculum is necessary. Click, next slide, please. But it's certainly not sufficient. Um, giving kids, and I'm gonna go to the next slide, uh, one more. So this is from uh, my friend, Jeff Dietrich, who um, I use this all the time, Steve Jobs' model of educational reform. Um, just putting computers in front of kids uh, will not change anything if we put computers in front of kids and teach in the same old ways. Um, yeah, if you click through it, it will highlight some of those things. Um, we are not going to change um, the ability for those kids to be expert learners, as you talked about in the beginning. So uh, we need to think about deploying this technology in a very different way, which for me is what UDL is all about. Click again. Please, oh, sorry, I forgot this slide has lots of clicks, <laughs> um, which for me means rewriting those rules, but it starts with, in, in the day, we talked about multiple means of representation, expression, and engagement. I really think that digital media and technology, as you said, allows for flexible uh, materials. Um, teachers then can have and need to do flexible methods. Um, and then, so the, these are the pillars of UDL. We need to have clear accessible goals that can be um, achieved um, to, you know, maybe goal attainment scaling or something to greater and lesser extent by different kids. And then the ass ass assessment has to be authentic. And I think, again, that's where technology, digital media really come in for so many of the kids that I'm concerned about and then open doors and reduce barriers for all of the kids. And I'm going to just finish with my last slide. I think it's my last one. No, never mind. I'll talk about this later. <laughs> I won't talk about it at all. Um, and then, really, you know, technology by itself does nothing. It's technology in the context of the UDL environment that really uh, makes this magical. But I think without digital media and without technologies, the burden of adaptation on teachers is so great. Um, if we really do mean all kids and every kid. Okay, that's me. Thanks, Kathy. That was uh, a great insight into thinking about how technology really plays a role in um, providing that access for all kids and making UDL really mean all means all. All right, and then next we're going to have uh, Dr. Matt Marino, and he's going to share his perspective on technology and universal design for learning. So thanks, Matt, Sue. and thanks everyone for having me. I appreciate being here and being part of this uh, esteemed panel. Kathy, I was doing the math and I was in fourth grade in 1982 when you started. So I, I do qualify as being alive during that period. I, oh my goodness, just barely. I am so old, oh my. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm gonna be fairly brief and that way we can get to the panel discussion. But I did want to speak to a little bit about my past because I was a pathobiologist by training who then became a middle school teacher and taught in the special ed world and the technology world. But really, I want to talk a little bit about learner variability. And because my area of focus is at the secondary level, I have a, a unique 
perspective related to science and secondary instruction, right? So if you could go to the next slide, please, Sue. And when I think about technology and the foundations as being central to the foundations of UDL, at first I thought absolutely it's essential. And then I had a doctoral student who was an early childhood specialist who slapped me around a bit and said, you absolutely do not need technology to do UDL in an early setting. And I agree with her now after a period of time. I think it's a lot easier at the secondary level to use the UDL framework for instruction, but it's not essential. So as far as your assertions go at the beginning of your slide presentation, Sue, I think I, that um, I go back and forth between three and four, which was teachers can create lessons without technology and this is silly, technology is ubiquitous um, at this time. So I think about learner variability and the different barriers to instructional practice. And as you can see on this slide, I've identified four of them. If you go to the next slide, please, Sue. You can see that we break down cognition in the science world into these different into these different blocks so symbolic representation domain specific vocabulary etc and i was have been working for the last decade now on the use of video games as a way to actually implement udl as part of a classroom so next slide please sue i want to talk just really quickly about you make me sick this was a game that I helped uh, develop with Filament Games out of Madison, Wisconsin, and it won a STEM award from the Institute of Education Sciences uh, a couple years ago. And so in this game, we had students who were really struggling to understand content-specific vocabulary. So for example, they were having challenges decoding what a spirochete bacteria was and it was taking so much cognitive load for them to do that that during this two-week unit they had on different pathogens they were getting completely lost in day one and day two so we came up with this game you make me sick the goal was for the player to make the host this guy pudge who you see in the upper right hand side of the screen as sick as possible and the students were able to play through this game in 17 minutes. And during that time, they would cover all of the content that was included in two weeks using standardized instruction. Now, I do want to point out that while we were able to improve the accessibility and reduce the learning barriers for a lot of kids, there are still barriers that are inherent in the game design itself. And so if you think about the fact that a blind, a student who's blind would not be able to access this content, that is 100% accurate. And that gets us to another point that uh, Dr. Basham and I might argue about later, which is at what level does it become UDL, right? Is 90% accessibility the measure? Is 95% accessibility? I don't know. Next slide, please, Sue. Um, and, and I just wanted to point out that when you're using technology and the UDL framework, it's important that you map the different components of what you're doing within the technology to the UDL checkpoints. Next slide, please, Sue. And you can see in the, in the game design world, we do that by calling out different user interface features and then articulating how those contribute to the universal design framework and instructional practice and assessment. Okay, the next slide. All right, that was quick, huh? <laughs> that was quick, Matt. <laughs> Thank you. Anything you wanted to add before we move on to Matt? I, I would just reiterate that I think UDL can be done, especially at the early ages without the use of technology, but certainly at the secondary level, it makes instruction much, much easier. Absolutely. And I, I think you're raising well, two points I want to make before we move on to Matt. And 
I'm starting to hear this idea emerge that, um, you know, when we're really talking about getting past some of the more significant barriers that technology uh, is part of the answer, when we start thinking about how we need to help kids move to understanding and get past, to get to that conceptual and, and, and actually move past those barriers, that's when technology seems like it's just a non-negotiable. But I also want to point out that I, I think uh, I liked hearing your conversation and maybe your call to Jamie for uh, some response about this magic tipping point. When does what I'm doing actually meet some level of criteria to call it universal design for learning? And I, I think that's a debate we could have for the rest of the uh, webinar if we chose to. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to hearing that. And now we're going to pass it over to Matt. Uh, so Matt, go ahead and introduce yourself and, and tell us your story. Uh, absolutely. Well, thank you, first of all, for having me here. And uh, Kathy, I just want to let you know, I started my teaching career in 1982 as well. Uh, so, you know, we, we were both very young in our teaching career, right? <laughs> I, <Not babies>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I won't even tell you how old I was in 1982. Uh, but but anyways, I have a really, really high tech presentation tonight. I have uh, where it all started for me right here, uh, a post-it note, uh, UDL rocks, uh, it says. And so my my uh, journey actually started with a post-it note. Um, and that was my um, tool that I used all the time in my classroom. I was a middle school and a high school teacher uh, in public school setting for many, many years. And uh, then in 2010, my position was cut. And so I had to make a choice, you know, do I go uh, into education to go to the dark side and become an administrator? What do I do? And it was about that same time that I heard about this graduate course called Universal Design for Learning. Uh, and so I decided that I was going to learn a little bit more about Universal Design for Learning. In fact, I was going to get trained in teaching this graduate course for uh, LaSalle University uh, in Pennsylvania and Maryland and uh, the College of New Jersey. Uh, in New Jersey. And so I met a good friend of mine, John Mundorf, who showed me what UDL was all about. And uh, a couple weeks later, I got a phone call from the Milton Hershey School. And uh, the Milton Hershey School is one of the most unique schools in the world. 100% uh, of our kids come from poverty. And uh, we get 80% uh, come from Pennsylvania, but the remaining 20% come from all over the nation. And so I was uh, allowed to teach at Milton Hershey School at the high school. And I absolutely loved it. And that's where UDL really popped for me because um, I love the expression to say that you can take the kid out of poverty and you can give them all these resources, but you can't take the poverty out of the kid. And so uh, in one of my classes, I found that just reading assignments were creating barriers for my kids. So I came up with an acronym. Uh, I'm a Midwest boy. I'm originally from Ohio. So we don't call soda, soda. We call it pop. Uh, so uh, I came up with the acronym POP, and uh, P stands for predicting barriers that may occur, and O stands for overcoming those barriers, and P start, is talking about planning. Uh, and so what I started doing was I started looking at what barriers existed in a reading assignment and started differentiating the reading materials. And I started looking at potential barriers that vocabulary offers. Uh, I started thinking about reading comprehension, all sorts of different things. And it just really created a passion for infusing UDL uh, into my classroom and infusing technology. So it was about that same time that a colleague of mine came up to me and they said, wow, you got some really good ideas. I've never heard of this UDL stuff before. Uh, why don't you start a blog? And so that's what I did. In 2010, I started a blog. Uh, it's called Learn, Lead, Grow. Uh, you can find it at uh, my last name, Bergman, uh, B-E-R-G-M-A-N hyphen uh, UDL dot blogspot dot com. And uh, honestly, like the first year, I, I might have had 100 views. And I think it was my mom clicking refresh 100 times, uh, you know, and, and uh, it really I just really didn't get it at that time what UDO was all about. But uh, over the years, it's just expanded. And it, it has just uh, been an incredible tool to just find ways to infuse technology uh, into the learning environment. Now you may think that, you know, I'm all about technology and technology is the end all solution uh, for UDL, but I'm a firm believer that it's not necessarily the tool you use, but how you use the tool 
uh, that it makes the difference. And so if you're using technology, that's great, but how you use the technology makes all the difference in the world. Uh, but technology was, my ideas on technology were challenged in 2012. Uh, when I went to the Bartholomew Consolidated School Corporation in uh, Columbus, Indiana uh, with a, another good friend of mine, George Van Horn, and um, I was told that I could make a presentation on UDL, but I couldn't use any technology. And so I titled my presentation, No Technology, No Problem. And so it really challenged my thinking on how to incorporate different strategies for UDL in a K through 12 environment. Uh, so fast forward to about two years ago, um, I made the move out of the classroom from a high school teacher into what is called a learning technology specialist. And so what I do is I have a very unique job where I help teachers, I help house parents here at our school because it's a residential school and administrators infuse technology uh, into their daily lives and into the student um, learning experience. So uh, I actually um, was uh, placed in an elementary school. And uh, so I've learned so much about the elementary school classroom and showing teachers down here how to infuse technology in a UDL type of way. So uh, I'm just so blessed to have K through 12 and graduate experience um, infusing um, universal design for learning. Um, and my blog, I just wanna focus real quick on my blog and then I'll, I'll turn it over. Um, my blog has really changed my life and really changed my outlook on what universal design for learning is um, for uh, several personal reasons. Um, one is I recognize that there's, we're highly variable in just our lives and how we live. And, and so in 2014, I believe, I started something called Clicks for a Cause. And so it's a tradition. Every November, what I do is on my blog, uh, for every click that somebody visits my blog during the month, I donate, along with other donors, uh, a penny to the medical fund of a child in need. And it's been really neat because it's allowed me to work with students in the margins and work with families in the margins um, and just in a, in a UDL type of way. So it's been really cool to see how that's just given back. Um, and um, I'm also starting a, a new journey as well with this, this blog. Um, I just started something uh, just a few, few months ago that where I'm gonna interview 50 leaders in a year and uh, get their experiences. And I wanna see the variability that exists in leadership, not just at the school level, but in the business realm and um, throughout uh, nonprofits as well. So I've been blogging about that as well. I'm up to 30 leaders uh, now here uh, in 2017, and I'm giving myself until October 17th, 2017. That date is very significant for me for uh, several reasons, but I'm uh, just really happy to be here, and uh, I'm going to pass it on to Jamie. All right. Well, thank you, Matt. I love that it all began with a sticky note. I, I wonder how many wonderful life-changing events began with sticky notes. We should, we should do some study on that. Uh, and there is a post-it note app too. So, you, you know, go. yeah, technology. Absolutely. I also love this idea of no technology, no problem. Maybe someday we'll have to have you come on and uh, do that, revise that presentation. I'd love to see it. Well, thank you for sharing your story with us and for sharing your website. Um, so for those of you who uh, didn't get it, I, I'm sure Brian put it in the chat for you. Uh, it's Lead, Learn, Grow. Uh, excuse me, Learn, Lead, Grow. Um, and you can get it by uh, Googling Matt Bergman, uh, Universal Design for Learning, and you can get a link to that too if you um, didn't copy the link from the chat. Thanks again, Matt. Okay, Jamie. We are going to turn it over to you, your bat and cleanup today. So uh, why don't you go ahead and give us your UDL story? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for asking me to be on it. This is actually one of my first times actually on a network and learn since we first started these things uh, a couple of years ago. Um, so, you know, my story is many people's story started, uh, started as a teacher. And uh, so well, well before graduate school and being a professor, you know, I was in a classroom wherein I was supposed to teach kids science. And I spent half my day as an inclusionary consultant uh, working and my, my schedule consisted of uh, uh, co-teaching biology, co-teaching algebra, and then co-teaching geometry, my first three hours. And then I moved into having a, uh, a break time and then I was supposed to go back and uh, teach the self-contained science and stuff for kids that couldn't make it. And 
supposedly in the general education classroom. And so uh, long story short, uh, the books were really outdated that I was given and I wasn't given any lab materials. And so I was like, well, how am I supposed to engage these kids if I don't have lab materials? And so we took a story, this is back in the day, and there was a movie that had just come out in the early 90s. So I'm a little bit younger, I guess, than Kathy and Matt. <laughs> but um, uh, in, in the early 90s, there was a movie that came out um, where Robin Williams in Dead Poets Society had the students rip up the books. And so we, as, uh, you know, as a young teacher, I had my students ripping up old science books in the in the class and then we went down to the tech prep computer lab to to teach science uh throughout the year uh, uh with four 46 computers split on a 14-4 modem and so i i have a, a big tie to technology and the work going on there um but like many others here um i don't think technology is necessarily good without without this without the design component. And so I think that's where I come into it. So I kind of think it's a nonsensical academic and sometimes uh, fun drinking argument. So I've kind of started drinking here tonight because uh, I think that's what we should be doing and having fun at these things. Um, I do think, you know, it's, it's somewhat of a silly argument, right? I mean, it really kind of comes down to how do we design learning environments for all kids? So if we understand the variability that we have in our room, how do we design for that variability? We have seen, uh, as many people have talked about here, and, and as we travel, as I've traveled throughout our great country in the, in the US and, and in other countries beyond the US, we've seen uh, implementation of UDL both in very high tech sort of areas using technology very wisely. Uh, we've seen tech, I've seen technology used not so wisely in UDL in UDL based environments, and then I've seen very low tech uh, doing quite well. Now, that being said, they were designing for the variability they had in the room. So it comes down to how do we design for the variability that that we need to approach. So next slide, please. The, the big question that we're really not getting to here, and because I do, you know, my day job is as a professor, we have to have like big questions about what do we actually mean by technology. And so if, I, if my students would be in the, uh, we'd be talking about this in class, if we were having this class, like what is actual technology? What do we mean by it? Oftentimes when we're thinking about it here, we're thinking about very high tech sort of tools, right? People are probably thinking about, uh, you know, my mobile phone or you know a computer and and such but really technology in and of itself right technology in and of itself really is just the application of how we take scientific knowledge and design around practical purposes it's like taking what we know and and putting it into something that can be used so as uh, in fact as i learned uh, from joy and reading some of joy's early work and some of their early work in the field, I mean, we know that like this pen is in it is of itself technology. So part of the reason this is a silly argument is because it's a silly argument because we are actually using technology all the time, um, but that we're not probably using the technology that people equate as technology. So next, next slide, please. The second piece to this argument is that UDL is primarily about design, right? Primarily when we think about UDL, it's about design. So if we look at the guidelines, it, it breaks things down. And, and what most people don't realize about the guidelines and the, and, and the checkpoints themselves is that at the base level, it's about accessibility, right? And it's about the accessibility we have in, in, in the room. Um, and then at the next level, it's about processing and understanding, making sure that students can process and understand the information and the learners in the room given the variability are able to go through and do that and then the top level is really kind of about this higher order sort of metacognitive sort of level of thinking and so really within udl as a framework we're thinking very broadly about design obviously getting back to the notion of the silly argument that technology plays a role plays a role in some of that right but at the end of the day it's like Matt said it's what you do with what you are have not not necessarily just saying oh we're gonna use technology today next slide then the third piece of it is one of the things that we talk about here 
are the four critical elements of UDL. And so the IRN some years ago in our co-founder, Jeff Dietrich, worked with about 100 teachers to say, you know, when you're implementing UDL, what are you actually doing? And if you go onto our website, we actually talk about this, right? We actually have some breakdowns of this. And these, these 100 teachers kind of came up with this. And so they were given a design constraint, similar to the Matt given a design constraint saying he couldn't use technology to present. Their, their design constraint was simple. Make sure it fits on one page because we know a lot of people won't read more than one page. And what they came up with were four things. That when we're implementing UDL, that we always have clear goals, right? We have clear goals. That I as the, I, as the teacher know the goals, but most importantly, the learners themselves know the goals. And they're able to talk about what the goals are. That there's intentional planning for learner variability in the environment. That we use flexible methods and materials. Again, flexible methods and materials can be made up of different things. And that there's timely progress monitoring to essentially ask yourself, how's that working out? And do we have to iterate the design and, and kind of go through a redesign process? So that's the third reason why I think it's somewhat of a silly argument, because if you're actually meeting the criteria of the critical elements and you've actually designed around those critical elements, then by and large, you should be doing it. But we also know that being that it's design based, that it, there's iteration that takes place, that we proactively plan but at the same time, we have to learn from what we planned and then iterate from there. Next slide, please. Finally, I want to kind of highlight one of the other sort of uh, things that's going on here. And if people aren't aware of it, um, there's a listserv for you to join that CAST has teamed up with, um, and I don't remember if I put the next slide in. <laughs> so, no. No, nope. the next slide is um, your your final final slide, Jamie. Oh, okay, great. So, uh, CAST and the IRN, as well as the task force, have the UDL task force have teamed up to essentially uh, talk about talk about <laughs> Matt's telling me to have another drink <laughs> to talk about and think through uh, both credentialing and certification. So there's the, we have the credentialing and certification initiative. And within this initiative, what we're doing is having this real big conversation around what does it actually mean to be educated and understand UDL both theoretically and apply it, being credentials. And then what does it actually mean if for a district to, or a technology company or another group to, as an organization to, to say we are actually implementing UDL and to get certified. You can learn more about the initiative at udl.cci.org, and you can actually sign up for sign up for uh, information about it to get updates on it, newsletters and such. Um, but this initiative is ongoing, and, and we kind of just started it off about a year ago. Uh, we're going to have something in the marketplace and, and really out for the field to actually sign on to here in the next six months. Um, and we're looking for people that are interested in piloting some things. But this is another thing that we have to kind of consider, right? So that as technology companies are saying, hey, we are the UDL solution and we're getting a lot more of that nowadays. What does that actually mean? And how do we actually, uh, how do we actually certify that, if you will? And so that's what we're working on now is certification. So it's interrelated to the conversation here tonight and I think people should be aware of it. It's not necessarily exactly, exactly what we're talking about. We can do a whole network and learn series on this initiative. But if you want to go learn more, you can go learn more at this, at this, um, at the website. But at the end of the day, I think what we need to do is, um, if you want to talk about this, continue talking about this. We should sit down, have a drink, and kind of keep on keep having the conversation. All right, thanks, Jamie. Uh, so I I like that your um, whole argument was that this network and learn is a silly conversation. But to that end, we're going to keep <laughs> it going anyway. Uh, and hear what our team has to say, what the audience has to say about this topic. And I'm going to throw it over to my friend, Brian Dean. I'm sure he's been working hard on the Twitter end and uh, mining the chat for questions and uh, going to give it over to you. Actually, while you're doing that, Brian, if you need a couple of minutes, we'll see if our panelists want to have, want to talk back and forth about um, what they heard from each other. So Kathy, I'll see you waiting and let you go. Because I got to, you know, I, I 
started off the conversation. I want to come back in. What what really good stuff tonight, guys. Thank you. I, I thought that was really fun. Um, there's a few things that made me struggle a little and I'm going to kind of, I guess, um, one of the things, um, well, maybe I'll start, I'll start with uh, with Matt and the idea of uh, Matt Marino, the idea that you could do a preschool environment without technology. And I totally get what you're saying. For the most part, you could. But if we wanted to really be inclusive, and, and maybe that's my big theme tonight is, and maybe it goes to the question of where does does udl end is there an end point or do we really mean all and every um, because if we really mean all and every then we have to think about those little pumpkins that i'm working with now that would come in the only way they could participate is with a speech generating device something like that so given that i think a big theme tonight has been but giving them that technology doesn't do anything if we haven't created things a little bit differently but i i i really want to think about um all and every and the fact and that's why i went back to the history lesson the fact that in my life what i've seen is the power of udl comes from the kids that and and i think um all kids, the kids in the room. I don't, I think Jamie, you said this, we're planning for the kids in the room. Well, I'm gonna be a little bit Canadian centric. If the kids in the room are all pretty, if, if there's a whole bunch of kids that have been sent out of the room because they don't fit to special schools, to special programs, then the kids in the room become, clearly not homogenous i know that's not true but they they're not on the the far the far ends and when i when i teach about udl i talk about the normal distribution and that all of those kids that's the normal range of human diversity um and what what was powerful for me about the beginnings of udl is it was out on the you know talking about the kids who wouldn't be in those classrooms who certainly weren't in those classrooms and from that from the blind kids from the you know kids with uh physical disabilities from the kids with cognitive disabilities came so many of the powerful ways that we are now thinking about how to make things how to reduce barriers for the broad kids so my talk my call tonight is to say let's not forget that um, it might not be just the kids in the room that we need to play. might we might learn more from the kids that are not in the room that have been sent somewhere else who might be able to be in the room if we think about digital materials and, and embracing technological solutions as well as really good design. And I'm, I think I'm on a, I think I'm on a, a pulpit now or something. So I'm going to step off and let somebody else talk. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks. Kathy, Kathy, I'll, to respond to Kathy. I'll jump in since Kathy called me out. But first I want to say, did you call me out because I said I was in fourth grade when you started? No, I love that. I, love that. I, I just called you out because I don't know. You were, I could have called any because because I love you, Matt. That's thank why. you, thank you, Kathy. Love you too. So, I I do want to respond by saying I think when I think about those preschool kids and the augmented communication system, I think you're a hundred percent right. Technology is clearly a way to improve the accessibility for those students and I, I would like to stop thinking about kids who are extreme um underachievers in a way that we would classically define that and and think about kids at the top end of the spectrum as well who may be gifted and talented and think about how we would get it at those kids and um i, I would well, how like, many of those kids might not be able to be identified if they didn't have aac devices sorry it, it's true it, you're a hundred percent right there but i do want to get to this point that you made a couple times about the kids in the room 
and talk about the fact that universal design for learning, if you're going to do it well, is extremely time consuming and costly. And so many times it's not practical to spend hours and thousands of dollars designing curricular materials for kids who aren't in front of you. But I want to let Jamie talk about that a little bit too. Can I just say one thing though? That goes sure. to my original point, which it shouldn't be teachers doing this. It should be curricular designers doing this. And to put the burden on teachers is just, hurts my heart. So anyway, sorry, I'm, I, I really will stop. So one of the things, and I'll just, I want to get out to the other people here to let them kind of weigh in too, but um, one of the things that I think we're trying to do with the CCI initiative is to raise awareness, but also that if companies are claiming that they're building curricular products and materials that are, are saying that they are aligned and, and based on, on UDL, that we've actually looked at that, we're able to certify to say that they are. So that's something that we are doing now, right? And it's going to help as districts go and purchase materials or, or ministries of education purchase materials, they'll be able to do that. You know, I was recently uh, over in Hong Kong area and, and working there and touring different schools and working in Hong Kong with that. And some of the issues that we think about from a variability perspective here, from a sensory variability, we have to appreciate there's various forms of variability that are not accounted for, even in the AT products that, that we, we talk about here. And so when we really truly talk about variability, we have to think about, about it very broadly. And so these are the, some of the things that we're talking about within the CCI initiative and advancing that. So, but I wanna get out to other, other the people in the audience. Thanks, off to you, Brian. Whoo, boy, this is this conversation straight fire right now. Um, everybody, uh, everybody's uh, lighting up both the chat and uh, uh, the Twitter uh, feed and answering, asking a bunch of questions. There's a lot of there's a lot of questions around the idea of uh, multiple versus flexible, and uh, are those two interchangeable, or does something become multiple means of doing something, and then there's flexibility inherent within that? Um, and so I, I just want to kind of mash all of that together and ask you folks, um, is that is that semantics? Um, and uh, the idea of there being a difference between flexible and multi of, or are they interchangeable? And also, uh, is the, the, you know, the word technology is a very loaded, uh, loaded term in education. And so is, um, and, I, and Jamie, you kind of hit on, everybody kind of hit on this, but, but that idea of, of redefining um, technology and, and if we use the word tool does that does that make this does that make this uh, more approachable as as a topic or two questions that kind of came up and I'll let anybody kind of jump in there and answer those and then I have some more no well. <laughs> go for it do it up it's it there's a vast difference between multiple and flexible multiple is what teachers do when they're trying to run around and get all these different multiple ways for their kids flexible is when you get something given to you and you can it's got inherent flexibility um and so what i what hurts my heart is that we've and I, I'm going to go back to that Orcos and McLean paper, which said um, we're going to create curricula, curriculum, so that teachers, so the and and I didn't I didn't copy the whole thing. So the burden is lifted from teachers, and of course teachers are going to still have the burden of matching things and making it flexible. And, and uh, yet. Um, I see too often in classrooms, teachers running around and trying to, I, I don't like this word, but I'm gonna use it, do UDL by getting all these multiple things. It's really hard. Whereas if we can be smarter, and, and, and I don't know if you know, at the beginning I used the term digital media as opposed to technology. Technology is the 
conduit. I mean, and you're right, this is techno. Language is technology. Um, so this is, and so I totally agree with Jamie, it's a silly word, but there's something very different when we talk about having digital media that is a, built accessibly, transformable, all of those originary things um, that is, is way, way different <laughs> from, from multiple for me. And I forgot the second part, but again, I'm talking too much. So I want to let other people know. Well, just a quick comment. I, I'm a, I'm Matt's, looks like Matt's getting ready to talk too, but I was going to say it really reminded me of how Matt's journey started too. So maybe that's where you were headed. Well, you know, and, and Kathy, you bring up a really good point because I think what it comes down to is a couple different things. One, um, what is your goal? Um, what is your goal? That, that's where it begins. I, I think also thinking about the design and what I see is sometimes teachers get hung up on meeting every single guideline and checkpoint of UDL in a lesson, which is just not going to happen or using technology in every single way um, in every single lesson. Um, and it's about addressing high probability barriers. And so I, when you're speaking, it reminded me of uh, Marshall McLuhan who said the medium is the message. And uh, I, I love that because um, for the reading assignment that I was talking about earlier, what's that? Another Canadian. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it it re reminded me of a couple different things. The reading assignment that I gave, what I found was that some kids needed a physical copy, some kids needed a digital copy, some kids needed an auditory copy, but yet we all, there was a study done, I think it was at Carnegie Mellon University, where they found that people had different learning experiences. If they heard an, a news article read, or they saw it on a television program, or they read it in a newspaper type of program. And so you, you do have different experiences with the, the mediums that you're using, but it also makes me fearful too, because when we have teachers flipping their classrooms, they just say, you know what, this video is gonna be just a great end all solution. And you know, they may have a transcript, they may have a video, but um, one thing that you really need to be important, what's really important is where are you posting that? And uh, YouTube is a great example. If you upload your video to YouTube, you could have that built in accessibility feature of automatic closed captioning so that you can enhance that tool a little bit better so that the medium communicates a better message. So uh, that's, that's my two cents for whatever it's worth. Brian, what else we got? Ooh, there's so much. Um, so uh, there's, there's a couple other questions. I want to pull one from Twitter. Um, uh, there's a, a question about in, in rural areas, you know, in rural, rural areas or areas of socioeconomic um, diversity and, and inequity, uh, the idea of, of technology and specifically AT technology um, is, is a very um, it's, a, it's a huge barrier. And so uh, the larger question is uh, that this person is asking is if, if uh, school districts can't afford or schools can't afford AT are they SOL when it comes to UDL and as she says I think I think no but um, I'd like to get some thoughts around that uh, when we bring it into the realm of, of uh, somewhat specialized technology Can I, I, I don't mean to hog up the airtime mm -hmm. here but um, I was in a rural school district uh, before I came to the Milton Hershey school and that was one of the biggest challenges that we had is uh, I needed to get iPads in my classroom. I needed to get different forms of technology in my classroom. Um, what a lot of teachers may not know is that your credit unions, um, they're great places to go for grants. Um, in the state of Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania Credit Union Association actually is begging for teachers to apply for grants of, and they award up to $10,000 uh, um, a year uh, for, and it's, it's a very easy process. So. I would look for creative ways of funding. And then Brian, I'm sure you can talk on, about this, is hacking your way um, into, into using technology in creative ways, using old cell phones, using old cell phones as ways to get on Wi-Fi, using, um, you know, just there's creative ways out there. It, it's, it is a challenge, but there are ways. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and you know, I'm, I, uh, Matt and I did a piece on, on how to use some, how to use cardboard and how to use all these other things and rephrase really what technology is to more, more tool-based and how do we take those materials and, and upcycle them for, for AT use. And there's tons of websites out there for that. And I think that, that that's really about 
it's, it may be somewhat semantical, but it's really, it's the same concept as, um, can we rephrase technology to be really, how are we using tools? And then like Kathy was saying, how, how are we using the idea of digital media? Um, how are we using the idea of interfacing with that digital? Um, the, uh, there's another question out there uh, that is kind of, kind of goes back to what Kathy was saying, that, that this is a huge burden on teachers. And, and while it is exciting to think that there are curricular designers in, in school districts, um, what if the case is that the teachers are the curricular designers in many ways? Um, how, do they, how do they then balance um, having, to, how, having to front end load this design, execute the design, iterate the design, then reflect on the design and reinvent the design? How, how, what's the time frame? How do they manage that time? Does anybody have any kind of ideas or clues? So I can just say that in the school, a lot of the school transformational projects that we've done, uh, there's little things like we, we found that teachers like planning specifically around more like unit level plans rather than less day-to-day uh, -day lesson plans. Um, and then they iterate based on those unit level plans. I mean, they, they'll make small iterations on, on the other plans too. And then the other thing too is we use things like Japanese lessons, lesson study wherein teachers will get together and work as a team to help support one another. So we often have grade level teams and or disciplinary teams or even interdisciplinary teams teaching. Actually, one of the schools that, one of the earlier schools, and I, I don't wanna say it, but it was like you know 10 plus years ago that we were actually going in and transforming and, and making a UDL based STEM school at that time. They were, um, you know, they, they did, they, they kind of came up with themselves, we had them, we kind of had them take on, as people have heard me talk about this, kind of a, a mindset of more of a learning engineer where they go kind of through that design process more like an engineer, thinking about the solutions they need to, to overcome the problems that they encounter, the troubles they're having. And obviously they would bring technology to the table, et cetera, um, because of the flexibility it provides. But the other thing they would bring to the table are the, the, are the techniques and strategies and, and the pedagogical practices but then they would share and exchange those ideas with one another and then learn from those and then iterate on those ideas. So I think it's part of the reason when we, when we work in schools to implement UDL, um, we often have uh, single teachers coming to us and saying, you know, I just saw your, I just saw you give this talk and I want to try and do this in my classroom. Can I do it as a single teacher? And I don't ever say you cannot attempt to, to, to implement, but it, it becomes really, really hard as a single teacher trying to maintain this and continue it in your classroom. Um, but a team of teachers or school teachers, oftentimes we look at a school or a classroom or grade levels, uh, transformational changes, it helps out a little bit and carrying some of that load because it is thinking differently about how we do planning. Someone had said earlier in one of the chats that it has teachers think, uh, plan smarter for how they actually uh, do uh, implement their instruction. And so looking at UDL as a framework for building upon for effective instruction is, is an important way to think about it. Thanks, Jamie. So um, I know we are past our nine o'clock deadline, but Ryan says there's one last really deep question. Are you all in for, for hearing it and responding to it? Okay, I got thumbs up. Viewers, if you can hang in there, um, I think you're gonna be happy you did. If not, you can always catch it on the recording. So Brian, I'm gonna toss it over to you. We'll take one last Twitter question and then give our panelists an opportunity to say final words. All right, so this last one comes from inside the chat. Uh, Eric Moore, one of our participants and uh, um, UDL IRN uh, superstar as well, giving killer uh, UDL chat at the last summit, asked this question. Does designing for target variability or locally undermine the notion of designing for predictable variability or the generality of, of variability? Um, does this fall back into differentiation and typology? So I'm going to just make like that's the mic drop because that, that is a fascinating I'm gonna, I'm, question. I'm going to be the girl and respond first. Um, I, and I'm going to be a little bit pragmatic. One must design for the variability that is in front of you. That's your obligation as a teacher. However, if we never think bigger and broader than that, have we really done, and I think this is what you're saying, are we really, um, are we really getting to what the promise of UDL is? 
So yes, and I, uh, I, I pragmatically, although I totally continually um, lobby for uh, curricula that can be designed for teachers to use, um, I understand the reality of things. And so, Eric, I'm going to say we have to design. And, and in that designing for the students that are in front of us because of the individual differences, because of the diversity of this one, each of us, you're going to be a better teacher. You're going you're gonna to do things better. Kids are going to be more engaged, blah, blah, blah. But for me, the real promise of UDL is the stretch is the stretch and therefore design that stretch then can make it easier if i can teach the kid with multiple disabilities to read and write and communicate um, then i can teach anybody so i'll, I'll leave it like that <laughs> there again another soapbox perhaps <laughs> so um i think it's it, i'm trying i was trying to process that question as you're reading it but if you can but my understanding of the question is, is kind of similar to Kathy's, is that one of the things you have to think about is who, who's your audience? Like who's your, who's your uh, who, you, who you responsible to, right? So the teacher's obviously responsible to the kids in the room. Uh, the principal's obviously responsible for the kids in the school. The district leaders are obviously responsible for the district, the kids in the district. Uh, and then we kind of get up to, you know, a curriculum developers, obviously responsible for the kids in the marketplace and, uh, that they're trying to design for. And these are the things that, again, I, I, I just want to say, look at the CCI, udl.cci.org initiative. And that, those are some of the conversations that we're having because we're wanting the people to think about your level of responsibility and what you're actually designing for and who you're actually considering when you're making those design decisions. So as a school district is, if a school district is implementing a new, uh, adopting a new textbook series, are they really kind of considering all kids? And when we talk about all kids, are they talking, are they considering the 23 languages that are being spoken in their district? Are they, are they considering the kids with, uh, that read three, four, five, six grade levels below? You know, those are the types of things that, that we're having people consider and thinking about the types of variability that actually exists in our learning environments in our schools today. And that's actually, that's actually the responsibility. And that's what we're talking about here in the design process. Jamie, I really like that thinking about it in terms of your level of responsibility and that it grows the higher up you go, you've got more kids you're responsible for and the more things you have to be uh, considering as you're making those decisions that that really resonates, uh, I think, to me anyway, in terms of how we wrestle with what we need to do to make sure all kids are included. Um, it, does anyone want to give some final comments before we say thank you to our panelists and good night to our viewers? I, I just want to say one thing. It's um, one of the things that we have to realize is that um, the kids, the kids are what, what matters. And we need to have a kid's first mentality. And in, when my first teaching job happened, um, several years ago, um, many, many years ago, um, we had a group of Russian immigrants move into our community who didn't know any English at all, didn't know it at all. And they came into my classroom and I was expected to teach these kids and I will never forget my administrator's response. He said, you just give them a book, just make them type something out of the book, just do what you got to do to keep them busy. And that still haunts me to today because I think about those kids and I think about three of those kids in particular that did not get the best of me at that time. And so if you are an educator right now, don't lose sight of those kids uh, in your classroom. Uh, there's a good quote by Garth, or Garth Stein who wrote a book called The Art of Racing in the Rain, a real tearjerker. And he said that um, where your eyes go he was referring to race car driving. Where your eyes go is where your car goes. So where are your eyes? Where is your focus? Are you focused on the kids or are you focused on all the problems and all the challenges and all the barriers and all the not, I can't do this and I can't do that? Because you might surprise yourself and you might actually um, surprise some kids in your room and touch the lives of kids if you just look beyond uh, just the, the seats in the classroom and look and see the kids sitting right in front of you. So.
Thank you, Matt. Any, any final comments from the rest of our panelists? I, I would just say that all of us can make a, di a difference. It doesn't matter what level you're at. If you're the classroom teacher, you can lobby to your district um, curriculum adoption board, talk to them. They're the ones who are going to drive what the developers actually produce. And so everybody has to do their part to make UDL happen. And if we all push it forward, then we can truly make a difference. All right, Jamie, any final words? No, I've been, I, I'm just going through some of the questions just now on the side. Okay. Um, it's been a great, great, um, it's been a great conversation and, and uh, join us at the next summit or conference uh, next spring and, and we'll continue the conversation or uh, catch us online. Yes, our next net Network and Learn is coming up in June. So more details about that coming up soon. We've got another great set of panelists and we're very excited. So I'd just like to say thank you to Kathy and Matt and Matt and Jamie and of course our very own Brian Dean for um, your time tonight. And thank you for our viewers for coming and joining us. I know we ran a little late, um, but it was an intense conversation and an important one. And, and I really think that uh, I'm gonna leave you with Matt's quote and just say, Let's all make sure our eyes are on the kids because that's that's where our car goes. So everyone have a great night and thank Thanks, you again. Um, and we'll we'll chat in June.